Hello. It's uh, Friday, March 15th, 2013, 11.24 a.m. here in the Pacific coast um, of the Salish Sea, uh, very far northwest of the North American continent. Uh, today's Wujo is entitled uh, Habu. Now, Habu uh, is a, a Salish word, uh, but it's also the title of a very interesting book that you can get from Amazon, which about is all about Native American stories from Puget Sound, uh, by Hilbert, and um, edited by Vi Hilbert. It's a very interesting book. It's uh, by no means um, inclusive. There are others that have written about this. But uh, habu is a word that, that you... Um, uh, here at uh, potlatches where the storytellers gather and so the kids sit around and the old farts like myself um, uh, get their bellies full of salmon and the fire starts to die down and then they sit around and they tell stories and as the stories um, wax and wane and uh, march and flow across the night the cry of habu comes up because that's a cry of encouragement for the storyteller when you get to a particularly exciting part it's sort of like a uh, polite form of applause in a um, uh, oral, aural, traditional society. And it's really interesting. Now, the book is really interesting, too, and it's also the subject of today's Wujo because the book is a, a concentration of stories from the Salish people, uh, the um, existence and interaction of a, a, an individual, a collective individual, uh, called Changer and the local inhabitants of the planet we call Earth or Terra. Uh, we also do find in Habu the book, um, edited by Vi Hilbert, that uh, there are stories in there of the interaction of the Salish and Tinglet peoples, with m mainly the Salish, hardly that much really about the Tinglets. They're more Alaska, far north, um, uh, First Nations people up into the Arctic. Uh, but in any event, there's stories about uh, the interaction of the local natives, our, our local boys as we call them, and the sky people. Now, I, I've done a lot of uh, reading on this. I'm an old fart. I've been reading um, on these materials uh, in terms of myths and so on from indigenous populations uh, for a long time. Plus, I've been in this area pretty much solid since 1969 and uh, know a great deal of, because I'm a working guy, I mean, I'm out working with everybody and and not in an office sort of a thing, uh, especially in my youth. I worked in the in the forests and the, what was known as resource uh, work here in the Pacific Northwest. So I have a lot of contact with native peoples and was quite fascinated by all the stories and have made a number of cross connections. Now, being a linguist, I can also track a lot of the linguistic clues between the individual uh, uh, dialects and subdialects of what in the overall aggregate is called Salish, which really it's not a... Um, it's applicable because we've got to label it with something, but there's a lot of reasons to object to that particular choice of a word, to label the overall group of languages. But in any event, uh, of the Pacific Northwest, but in any event, there are linguistic uh, connections that take, that can take one all the way from uh, Puget Sound up to BC and into Alaska, but also across the ocean to uh, Hawaii, to uh, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and even into Austronesia. And we also note that there's uh, structural similarities between how the Salish people here live and do things and such diverse groups as um, uh, the Japanese and um, uh, some of the Polynesian just in terms of the architecture. So for instance, the Japanese Minka farmhouse the aggregate communal farmhouse that existed effectively up until probably dominated the the country until probably the end of the Meiji era and then started fading out as uh, Western influences came in. But um, uh, that that Minka, that uh, Japanese farmhouse construction, is essentially the same uh, construction and, and operation of the uh, structure as are the longhouses here in uh, the Salish country. And they're also the same as the large canoe houses in uh, Polynesia and um, uh, Melanesia. Uh, some difference in Micronesia as to how their canoe houses are used, and so they're not really the same structure. But in any event, the um, 
So there's, there's architectural similarities between these groups of people that span the Pacific. There are uh, linguistic uh, connections that are solid, the same word, same phonemes, meaning the, and the same set of uh, meanings for the same uh, context uh, of that phoneme, basically the word is uh, found repeatedly throughout all of the dialects of the uh, all across the Pacific to Australia uh, and into New Zealand and the Maori and uh, even up as I say into Japan and then there's this weird strange cross connect between the Japanese and the Basque people which is just really bizarre. <laughs> there, are, there are sentences in Japanese that mean that are phonetically the same as the sentence in the in the Basque lang language and they mean exactly the same so let's let's figure that one out but in any event the the reason for this particular uh, discussion is all about habu now habu is a uh, as a uh, encouragement to uh, storytellers also is a shorthand uh, among those of us that uh, collect stories uh, from the native people uh, tracking down this particular set of, um, let's say, uh, historical archaeological theme and the uh, reality that we're able to process. Now, the reality that we're able to process includes the Nummo and um, Kerry Cassidy's favorite people, the Anunnaki. Now, in the uh, understanding of things, the let's just lay it out here, the Dogon people of Africa who have had the shit kicked out of them and been moved from place to place to place have maintained the longest, clearest uh, version of the one world understanding of humanity absent or outside of the Pacific Northwest for the longest period of time. Now we're really lucky. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, all the way up through Alaska, and the native peoples have maintained tradition and stories and basically um, uh, philosophical context that is the same as what we find among the Dogon people in Mali, who are now in Mali and getting the shit kicked out of them by the US and everybody else again. But um, the point of that is that this, this historical context about the uh, Nummo uh, are uh, is also found in Turkey and uh, the um, uh, that site that they found uh, something something Tepe I can't think of it at the moment where they found these just incredible statues that we cannot replicate now the thin delicate beautiful that that discuss exactly uh, the whole idea of uh, somebody coming here to earth and creating us and the somebody who came here is replicated in those statues in Turkey it's also they're also described here and the descriptions are all across the planet the same that a, an aquatic race that uh, had uh, basically had um, mermaid merman kind of uh, features and and f sort of stubby feet and mainly a tail but an aquatic race not amphibians per se but aquatic uh, came here and created all of what we know as the life on earth. Now there's a lot of details that uh, are consistent across a lot of the cultural influences including the descriptions of the Nummo as being really ugly bastards. <laughs> you know, actually I shouldn't say that. They're not bastards. <laughs> they're all female. Uh, but they're pretty ugly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, no offense to the Nummo. I don't think they, that they care <laughs> what their visual appearance is like. But from our perspective they're a little bit on the uh, disturbing side. Uh, also, in the Habu, in the native myths here, changer, which is their word for uh, the Namo, uh, was a what they called a collective being. So changer is referred to in the individual, but it was always also a collective word. And because all of changer was a kind of being that we can't really grasp, they did the best that they could in terms of uh, encompassing the details within the way in which the language evolved. And so the, the uh, Salish and Dinglet uh, people understood Changer to be as though to be an aquatic being and that if you encountered Changer and you met this uh, Nummo, let's just call him um, Terry, and you met Nummo Terry and you happen to sit down and have some blueberry pie with Nummo Terry and you know share a bit of salmon with Terry and have a discussion then maybe uh, five or six or eight years later you might meet another being that was half of Terry's age but knew everything that you had had every discussion every nuance and essentially was there with you even though they were not physically present and so the species of the Nummo as a whole from the viewpoint of the Salish while they were not mm, telepathic as we would think of it where they could send thoughts to and from each other shared a common 
uh, understanding or consensus or memory base or something. They were very different from us as humans. And the changer actually went to some uh, lengths to discuss this with the, the Salish and to ex try and explain what the differences were between uh, changer and the life that it had changed and why it was doing this. A lot of the why component was lost, but we still have the myth here in the Puget Sound region that the reason that Changer did this was to encourage the conditions that might allow humanity to become aware of its own eternity or eternal nature or immortality. Now, it is not immortality as we think of where, uh, you know, you're 63 years old and all of a sudden, you, you know, you go into a machine or whatever and it turns your body back to 20 and you go for another 40 or 50 years and repeat the process ad infinitum. Nothing along those lines. It is not a personal immortality that is related to the body. Rather, it is a personal immortality that is related to the uh, consciousness that's within the body and that we are as we are as humans because of the interaction of the NUMO with the species that existed here prior to uh, the changer changing things. This is a really a complex um, uh, underpinning of the entire existence of the Salish and the Tinglet peoples here is this issue of the changer and then later on the sky people. Now their myths, the, the Salish and the Tinglet, are very detailed. Uh, Habu, the book, uh, is it's a very good book. There's a, I can even give you the ISBN here later. Uh, it's produced by the Seattle or, uh, University of Washington. And here we go. Here's the ISBN. If anybody wants to write it down, I'll repeat it twice. Uh, it's a 0 295 4 So once again, 0 295 4 Now, um, there's several hundred pages in this book of uh, really good stories. There's all kinds of um, um, end, end notes and um, uh, descriptors and so on. But um, there are stories that uh, uh, could probably fill several thousands of pages in the uh, various um, dialects of the local forms of Salish, Lukashit and others um, alone and to say nothing of the Tinglet and the uh, Hawaiian and the uh, Polynesian, Melanesian, and Micronesian cultures, where changer is an interesting issue. We, I can get into that, maybe I've got a time here now, but in any event, okay, so changer is the local word for the Nemo, and changer is aquatic, and changer frequently uh, pops out of salt water, walks around, sees something, and, and uh, a creature that is, uh, has a certain potential and changes it. Now, the, it's not uh, capricious, it's not arbitrary, it's not uh, evil in intent. Um, it is, um, nonetheless, from the perspective of us who have been changed, very much a, uh, you know, uh, we are the victims of that change, if you will. We did not participate with the change, and those, those aspects of this relationship are reflected in the stories that we are different than we were before. Humans didn't exist before the Nemo came here and made us from the many species that they found. And they took some time to build us. Um, uh, but they did things like build raven, and they made mink, and they, uh, um, uh, you know, but some species were acknowledged to not have been changed. So for instance, salmon was a favorite of uh, the Nemo, and, and they did not create salmon, and they did not change salmon. And so there's many of the aquatic species that they left alone. They didn't screw with. Mainly, they, they were uh, altering those of us on the land. A lot of the uh, changer myths go to interesting stories about how we interact with changer in the sense of um, we, the changed beings, um, are, <laughs> well, some of the, sometimes we're really pissed about it, and other times we're um, annoying. Sometimes the stories tell why the being was changed, you know, like um, uh, Mink, for instance, gets uh, changed because he gets pissed at a, at a Nemo that stole, a changer that, that stole some of his salmon while he was having a nap, and so he, he runs ahead of the guy, uh, uh, this Nemo, and tricks the Nemo into drinking pee. <laughs> so the Nemo gets pissed and turns him into mink. So a lot of the stories are, are more about our 
uh, interaction as beings with changer than the change process itself. And bear in mind that these stories are, are very cool in their consistency because they never ever drop out to the point where they're out of the context and looking in. Uh, that's, that's sort of um, an interesting component of the, um, anything related to the Sumerian uh, uh, lineage for our understanding. Because so, for instance, the Sumerian lineage pr pr uh, presents much of their story, the Gilgamesh and all the other stories that essentially go into becoming the Bible and the Quran at all. All of the, a lot of these stories are presented from the viewpoint of the um, Anunnaki, um, who uh, were participating in uh, those things at that time, and so it's a it's a mishmash of those the the Sumerian and Hebrew and uh, which by the way is simply uh, the phonemes of Sumerian transliterated to a different alphabet, so it's phonetically ancient Sumerian really. Um, in any event, though the um, uh, the myths there have a perspective of some of the stuff coming from the perspective of the quote gods, the Anunnaki, those who came from the sky, and uh, the, some of the, the other stories from the perspective of the people that had to interact with them. This is not the case of the stories you find in the Pacific. Uh, all across the Pacific the perspective is always the same. Us being um, exposed to these beings and how we all react. And we don't ever get any perspective from the other side, from the being side itself. Very interesting insight I, I've noticed over the years. It just is. So I like the Salish and the Tinglet and the Melanesian, Micronesian, Polynesian, uh, you know, oceanic myths because they have a perspective of us guys, us local boys, what it was like. Now, getting back to the idea of the sky people, we have the sky people. We have the Anunnaki also here in the uh, Habu book and in a lot of the other books of the native stories here. And the sky people are not changer. The sky people came along quite a bit later. And the sky people are mm, much, much more ignorant and much more malicious and much nastier. And they're, they're basically not as uh, much more evolved than we are and they are just more powerful technologically and they cause all kinds of problems for us. And they're nowhere near um, emotionally or spiritually or intellectually uh, enlightened, uh, which could be said of the Nomo. Now, uh, the changer, no matter what, uh, no matter what the feelings are in any of the stories here, nobody was ever really pissed at changer. There was never any attitudes of warfare or contention. Uh, it was as though a, the local stories accepted that Changer did this, and again, we have no connection to what we were before Changer did this to us, so uh, we have this sort of mm, open and questioning attitude about Changer, unlike the stories with the Sky People. Now, the uh, Changer myth, by the way, if you get into it here, the it actually accounts for all of the weird pictures you see in the Vedic art of blue and green, and um, uh, other orange even uh, colors of humans because the changer myth talks about the various stages we had to go through in our evolution with uh, changer to get us to the colors that we are now and why they exist the way they are now and and not so curiously so I know it's the same central myth the changer stories up here discuss the uh, problems that changer created for itself or themselves, however we think of the species of the Nemo, because it might be a single being and, and spread across multiple bodies. We just are unable to determine this. In any event, um, they, they screwed up. They caused problems here according to the local uh, uh, myths. And they had to come go away and, and let uh, a terrible pollution episode die down and come back uh, perhaps millennia later. And then they were very, very apologetic to the, you know, what life was left, and they set about trying to correct the thing that they had done. And essentially, we're the result of that correction. I mean, us, the species, humanity. So, um, and, and it explained the whole uh, uh, changer myth explained within the Pacific Northwest tradition is basically the same changer, uh, the same myth as the Nemo, as explained by the Dogon. And in the description there, the Nemo came and took some DNA samples and accidentally, um, uh, in their effort to create a new form of immortality for their species and, our, and anything that lived on this planet, they created a being that was 100% male. 
Now you have to note that the Nummo are 100% by as a species female and that some small percentage of them turn to male as is required for propagation purposes. And that's the only reason that they become male and then they go back to being female. And so uh, again that's reflected 100% within the uh, changer myth as well that it's always a female aquatic being. And we never actually see that there's any male, we never get to meet any of the male um, uh, aspects of the Nummo in any of the Salish or uh, Pacific uh, dialect stories. All we ever get to see are the females. <coughs> Some of the other things, by the way, that are really cool is that the uh, local stories uh, reflect the difficulty of the Nummo in walking and how they would much rather swim or and in some cases they actually had to be carried because they're virtually incapable of climbing what we would think of as rough or broken terrain. And um, so uh, this jives 100% with the description of the Dogon have for the, um, for the Nummo. So Changer is this very interesting being and we have this relationship with Changer as a species, as do all the species on the planet now. And uh, we actually get our tendency towards mucking about with DNA from the fact that we had our own DNA mucked about with way back when. And indeed, there used to be blue humans and green humans and orange humans and bigger humans and so on. And that's just the whole setup of the myth. We also see in the uh, Hindu uh, Vedic stories, uh, again, confirmation of uh, green humans and blue humans. These uh, humans existed because, to a certain extent, of the conditions that existed in the solar system at, our, at that time. So, in other words, a um, uh, hundred million years ago, or two million years ago, or 250,000 years ago, the conditions in our solar system were different than they were, say, 80 years ago, as our solar system is now in the process of proving that the conditions next year and 20 years from now will be different than 30 years back or five years back. We're in the process of a transition into a new state of uh, being in our solar system. As we're able to tell with all these earth changes and then the um, uh, response uh, of, our, of ourselves to the earth changes. Um, all of humanity is in the process of altering itself. As are lots of species. They're going extinct and new species are going to show up. Anyway, though, the Nummo myth here in the um, uh, Pacific Northwest region uh, discusses the, and, and contains within it some interesting little uh, tidbits that we don't find in areas like the Sumerian, or at least that I have yet to encounter in the Sumerian if it exists, and nor have I seen it in the Vedic um, descriptions either that go back to uh, Manu. And the Manu myth in the Vedic understanding uh, Manu was like the Noah equivalent, and this fellow saved all of the, he saved a woman who knew the uh, names and uses of all of the plants. So unlike the Noah myth in the Bible where the guy puts all of the uh, DNA into a, a vessel and saves it all, which is basically the understanding of what's going on with the Noah myth, and that's a, also a real good description of the Dogons, uh, from the Dogon's view of the Nummo, because the Nummo had the ability to keep an infinite number of creatures in an infinitely small space. And it was because they were doing it by storing information about DNA, not even bothering to store the DNA itself, just the, DNA, the information about it. Um, in any event, up here we get an interesting understanding of the uh, relationship of the Nummo to our species, but also uh, the relationship of our species to other um, genetic altering uh, species such as the Anunnaki. Now the Anunnaki is described by the Sumerians and the uh, other texts including the Pharaohic and the Vedic text describe a species that we would call coneheads. Uh, very tall, um, nine, ten feet high, conically uh, shaped heads, um, uh, very dense bones, two sets of uh, teeth, an inner and outer set of teeth, uh, uh, differences in the cheekbones and the ear structures and the hands and everything uh, to the extent that these are not merely giant humans but they are uh, clearly a different species. And we find the cone heads remains here on this planet. Now the Anunnaki, as described by the Sumerian myth, uh, enslaved all kinds of um, uh, uh, humans in what we think of as Africa, all the way up through Kashmir. 
uh, all the way up through the um, uh, the Middle East, Northern Africa, through Turkey, up through um, over into India, and then up into Kashmir. And the reason that they did this was to make us into um, a mining unit for them because they were intent on mining gold among other minerals. And there's a lot of evidence that vast quantities of gold are not on our planet that used to be. And there's also evidence of huge amounts of mining activity all throughout the region that extends from South Africa um, basically all the way through the African continent all the way up into India, as I was saying, up into uh, far reaches in northern Kashmir, southern China. Now, in the, in the Pacific Islanders, through the Salish um, people's understanding of what went on at that time, they reference a situation where we existed as a species. We were created by the Nummo. All the species on the planet were created by the Nummo as a, an attempt to undo a grievous wrong that they had done to this solar system inadvertently. Um, you know, it was basically their fault. It was their, their oversight. And they screwed up, but they had, you know, it wasn't malintent or anything. It was just a, an accident. And so they caused a great deal of harm, and they felt they had to come back and correct things. And we are the result of that correction. Uh, all of the species exist in the planet in the solar system at this stage. Now, uh, the Nummo left because it was necessary that they not be here in order for our species to mature. And so we go through all of these... Um, uh, maturation processes and then uh, uh, over a couple of million years you know we go from blue humans through green and orange and through all the colors and we end up with the uh, humans that we have at the moment now about um, let, let's just to put a number on it let's just say about 253,000 years ago or in that realm of time the myths discuss the idea that um, the sky people came. And this is the name of the, uh, of the local Salish people and the Dinglet and um, uh, going, and actually all of the native peoples here in North America have um, descriptions of the sky people. And if you uh, get, get into the sky people myth here, you discover that indeed what they're describing is the Anunnaki from the Sumerian perspective. Now, um, so for instance, up here in um, southern Puget Sound, we have these really intense stories about this poor fellow called Canoe Maker, or Canoe Builder. And Canoe Builder was a nice guy, and he's obviously an um, asset to his village because he builds really good canoes, and everybody likes him, and they pay attention to the kind of canoes he's building, and he provides a general service to the to the community. And so when he goes missing, everybody notices, especially when he gets snatched up in the middle of the night by the uh, Coneheads or the Anunnaki, or as they call them here, the Sky People. Now, the Sky People are not nice individuals. Unlike the description of Changer, where we have a relationship with Changer that it does not involve violence, uh, does not involve um, force of will, Changer, once we existed as we are now, Changer, the Nummo, never attempted to influence us other than to provide us with information and allow us to make our own decisions. They never intended to enslave us. They were never intending to enforce um, their view of um, reality upon us. Any of that. Their goal was to create the opportunity for immortality to exist in a particular fashion that we might call eternal life, but not eternal in the same body, a rotating eternal life, which is basically what we have in, in, in any case, because you rotate from one body to the next uh, in, in your path towards immortality or towards understanding that, I won't go into all of that, but in any event, so here we are with the uh, poor canoe builder, and he's out, um, uh, as they all do up here apparently all the damn time, he's out hunting for some salmon to eat, and he gets some salmon, and uh, he um, uh, fillets it out and puts it on some alder sticks around a fire, and he's roasting his salmon, and he was going to have a little nap. as You know, it's tire tiring work to go out and get your salmon and do all this stuff. And so um, frequently in all the books and the stories, there's naps involved. <laughs> anyway, so the um, canoe builder, he gets his salmon going, and it's starting to, you know, um, smell good and, and um, uh, make little noises by the fire and stuff. And uh, he ha lies down to have a nap. And he gets uh, snatched up by the Sky People. Now, the Sky People used various different mechanisms to get the, the individuals up to the sky. And in this case, Canoe Builder is actually seen by the other villagers being levitated up to the, um, uh, to the sky. And while they're standing around wondering about this, they munch on his salmon and discuss the whole thing and, and uh, wonder what they're going to do without Canoe Builder and just what the hell's going on. 
Canoe Builder being taken is the first story I've been able to ascertain or to, to encounter that um, that I was able to ascertain was indeed an earlier form of the myth than some of the other stories. In other words, I think that this is like the proto-myth of the first kind of the abduction. And we note that also a lot of the interaction of the Salish and the Dinglet with the um, uh, the Sky People is very much a, uh, the same level of story being told by modern day abductees. Um, it's a horrific experience, it's not a nice experience, there's paralysis involved, there's levitation involved, there, there's these tall whitish looking uh, creatures that uh, have, have cone heads and are, are directing these little robotic guys to do things to you and uh, Canoe Builder did not have a good time with the Sky People and Canoe Builder was able to escape. Now the, there are several myth, stories about the myth of Canoe Builder escaping and being returned and he tells all about what had happened there uh, with the, um, um, the Coneheads, the Anunnaki, the Sky People. And um, from that point on there's actually a separate thread that talks about the reaction of the community here to the um, uh, Sky People. Now the community here in the Pacific Northwest was aware in the myth form that Sky People were down um, enslaving uh, other indigenous populations in what we now know as Northern California. And also they attempted to do the same thing here and the same thing in Alaska with the Dinglet people. And uh, um, these, all these individuals here uh, apparently were not very good slaves. They did not work out. And again, the goal was to do gold mining. We've got gold in uh, Northern California. There's gold to be mined up in uh, the Pacific Northwest and uh, uh, British Columbia. And then as well as Alaska, as we all know from uh, recent television shows and stuff. And so the, the most uh, telling of the stories, the most descriptive, come from the Dinglet, and they are the Alaska natives. And these people uh, had to fight the Sky People. And they developed strategies to fight the Sky People because they didn't want to go out and muck about getting gold for the buggers. <laughs> you know, they, they were just not really good slave material. <laughs> they, they resisted. They were irritated. You know, they wanted to eat salmon and build their canoes and to hell with digging this uh, weird sand out of the ground. They had no interest in it. So um, the, uh, the stories for the Dinglet talk about how they organized the whole um, groups and how they set up uh, perimeters to guard in the night so they couldn't be taken. And uh, they discovered also, we discover in the myths, that the Sky People, the Anunnaki, are afraid of uh, predators. Uh, or not, not afraid of them, but they're... Uh, they're very they ha they have they're very peculiar individuals as a, uh, unlike the Numo they are indeed individuals and an individual can be killed they don't have tele uh, tele uh, telepathic abilities uh, they do have all kinds of technology and they are are individually uh, long lived but that gives them a a very peculiar weakness and that is that they are very afraid of any kind of physical damage or damage to an extent that it will affect that that uh, the length of their life. And so they're somewhat paranoid and they uh, did not like bear, they don't like bear at all, and they're not really fond of dog or wolf up here. And so uh, we have many stories of the Sky People and the uh, local um, population in battles in which uh, the local population would lure the Sky People into traps where they would let the bears and the wolves deal with them. Um, and also the Sky People are... They're, they have an interesting issue with water. Uh, some of the myths there are very interesting because they talk about the, the Sky People and they have the sky people had to have a very special kind of a sky canoe in order to go across water and their sky canoes went across land easily could could settle down and were really a pain in the ass on the land but were less uh, useful 
in seeking slaves or whatever across the water. So whatever the Anunnaki's um, technologies were, they did have some limitation over the oceans of some for some reason. Our, the myths here are not that detailed as to why that was the case or anything. They just make mention of the fact that there were a couple of different kinds of uh, sky people canoes and that one of them, the water crossing one, you were safe if you saw it over land because it was too bulky or something to be a very much of a threat to you, but you had to watch out for the little ones that would come down and, and uh, scoop you up kind of a deal. And the, um, the Dinglet stories talk about the sky people and also a couple of um, interactions with um, uh, the kayak maker, the kayak maker up there. And so there's the canoe maker myth all through these. We also see the canoe builder myth in some of the very rare abduction stories that we see from the Pacific Islanders. Uh, but let me finish with the Tinglet in Alaska because they um, uh, they had an understanding that uh, they could effectively fight back against these very tall sky people. And in their study or in their stories, you see um, stories of where the kayak makers and others uh, set traps for them and kill them and basically uh, uh, gut them and use them for bait for more of them until the point where the Anunnaki say this is just not worth it and they left. And there was a great rejoicing through the land as the sky people stopped their activities and were seen to go away. Uh, so very interesting. But the, the descriptions here were that this ongoing period of contention with the sky people went on for multiple generations because canoe maker's grandson here in the Pacific Northwest uh, was still involved in uh, seeking ways to protect his people from the evil, <laughs> evil sky uh, conehead guys. Um, so very interesting there. Now, in the uh, another aspect of this that, that I found very curious is that the as you go deeper into the Pacific, into the islands, while the knowledge of the sky people rises, the number of abduction stories decreases. Is this a function of the myth, or is this just a function of the fact that these people, the Anunnaki, don't operate very well over water? And saw personally, pro uh, they were probably another issue was there, there's very little gold or m minerals or metal in any of the Pacific Islands, so there's very little reason to deal with the uh, people that, that live there. But there's two really curious stories uh, from two separate island groups that, that, or it's the same story from two separate island groups uh, describing the same incident from two different viewpoints. Uh, and basically, it's the viewpoint of um, uh, people here from the Pacific Northwest who had been abducted, canoe builders basically, in their early um, stage of things, uh, the very early contact years, and the Anunnaki decided they didn't like them, so they just pitched them out over some Pacific islands. And these canoe makers found themselves spending the rest of their lives and trying to integrate with the local uh, Pacific Islanders after having escaped or been thrown out or something from one of the Sky People vessels. A uh, very interesting story there. Now, another thing, too, was that the um, myth up here is you go into the um, uh, various different forms of the myth within the Puget Sound region, you find that Canoe Builder was explicitly chosen by the Anunnaki. And they chose Canoe Builder uh, because this was an individual that demonstrated a sophisticated understanding of technology. In spite of the fact that there were no metals being used, uh, the canoe builder was able to create these very nice structures and obviously was building a technological solution to a series of problems. And so it makes sense that the Anunnaki would like to um, grab the smartest and the best among the um, uh, apes, if you will, to make the end of their slaves. You know, the indigenous population that they consider to be uh, sub-Anunnaki, uh, you know, just mere humans. Now, also uh, another curious reference here within these myths is, uh, or a connection to that, is the weird story by um, L. Ron Hubbard called Battleground Earth or Battlefield Earth, something like that, because the same explicit understanding of the Anunnaki um, seeking, the very tall conehead guys, seeking uh, technologically capable humans is expressed within that story as well. That the their version of the canoe builder, this particular individual who had the ability to grasp the idea of technology, was a very valuable human. In any event, so uh, really interesting components to the whole Nemo and the Anunnaki myth, especially in the local areas here. And this is by no means a detailed introduction to them. The, uh, as I say, there's several hundred uh, pages of myths in the in stories. Um, I would say the majority of which actually are dealing with changer uh, in Habu. 
and there's other books and other um, uh, story collections available that also go into the whole idea of the interaction of changer with this planet. So, um, you know, what's interesting here is the juxtaposition, the, the, um, and the contrast between that we see in the Salish stories and uh, the Pacific Islander stories uh, between the Nummo uh, and the Anunnaki. Now, in the Pacific Islander stories, they had interactions with the Nummo. The Nummo are aquatic beings. They had no problems with water. And this may represent a form of duality or contention between the Nummo and the Anunnaki, uh, as in you know, uh, Earth versus or air versus uh, water beings. Uh, the Anunnaki apparently preferred to spend most of their time in their ships uh, away from the surface of the planet, didn't even like camping here. Whereas the Nummo, there's a lot of stories of the Nummo coming on up and, you know, sitting around the campfire and having salmon and, and chatting with people and, you know, having a big snooze and going off in the morning. So they're just like regular folk, uh, except they're these aquatic, slightly ugly fellows uh, or, or females. Um, but in general, you know, nice guys all the way around. Uh, and our relationship with the with the Nummo is interesting because in the stories up here they also describe the strife between the changer and those who came later, the Sky People, and how the locals here were very upset uh, that the Sky People were here mucking about with changer's work, and that the canoe builder also talked about how uh, what he had discovered in dealing with the you know being abducted by these guys the Kona heads, the Anunnaki, uh, the sky people, that they were uh, in some engaged in some level of contention or, or war warfare with the Nummo and were aware of each other and didn't like each other. And the Anun Anunnaki were uh, very much, um, the sky people were very much more aggressive about it all than were the Nummo, but they kept running up to uh, basically a wall where they had no ability to affect the Nummo technologically because the Nummo were so far superior. But that the Nummo, not being particularly vindictive or anything, didn't feel that it was necessary to interfere with the Anunnaki as long as they weren't being attacked. Basically a live and let live policy. If you're not hassling me, I don't care what you're doing, but if you come on over and you try and hit me, I'm going to thunk you in the head with a big stick and you'll have to go away. And so uh, it really frustrated the Sky People. The Sky People were looking for hooks and ways to get at the Nummo. Uh, they thought there, I, I don't think there was any, there's nothing in the stories that say that they were gonna use humans in any way that way, other than just merely use humans as slaves to, to um, uh, extract the minerals that they wanted. Also, by the way, the Nummo were very clear in stating to the humans that Changer was not a god. And Changer was to them as they will be to some other species in the future. Not a god, but its creator. And so uh, this is just the way of life in the universe. And they don't get hung up in this. Now, the other part of this is that Canoe Builder is repeatedly told by the Sky People and the Anunnaki, we're your gods, we created you. <laughs> and he says, you know, basically bullshit. <laughs> that, you know, we, we know our creator, and that's the Nummo, and Nummo ain't no god. <laughs> you guys sure as hell aren't either. And we're not going to put up with this shit. And so, um... Uh, if you look at the stories here, you find out that we're in throughout um, the Aryan nations all the way down through the um, uh, down to the tip of South uh, Southern Africa, uh, they were able to um, the the Anunnaki were able to make some inroads and and take lots of prisoners and cause problems and this sort of thing. Up here, they ran into a group of people that just weren't going to have anything of it, as well as conditions that allowed those people to. Um, uh, do very well. We didn't have plains up here to deal with. The plains Indians had an entirely different relationship with the Sky People. Uh, they were much more affected by them than the uh, local indigenous population uh, throughout the coastal regions. And I think a lot of it has to do with the terrain and the trees and so forth around here. It's you know, it would be difficult to find people uh, uh, 500 feet down in the ground in old old growth forests. Uh, even with heat sensing devices, it's just just <laughs> that isn't going to work very well. Um, so in any event, the Skype people, the Anunnaki, abandoned this region up here, and thus we have the situation where the locals basically won out against the Skype people. It wasn't a uh, clear-cut victory in that sense. It wasn't that we defeated them, but we defeated their intention and they went away because it wasn't profitable. Uh, did they come here first? Was this an aside? Um, to their gold mining in Africa and uh, Kashmir, no way of telling. 
the uh, stories throughout the uh, Pacific Islands would seem to suggest that the um, sky people uh, skipped across the uh, Pacific from basically the, the contact in New Zealand and the Pacific Northwest were probably more or less simultaneous. And also, the, if we were to look at some of the indicators that we get from the, um, uh, the more polar peoples as they describe the sky people, it would seem to be about 200,000 years ago. Uh, there's no, they don't have an uh, astrological understanding that they present in these stories. It's not like there's the, any kind of a um, sidereal uh, understanding of the uh, planetary movement or anything that it could be hidden in the myths. But we do get a, a sort of an Earth time understanding that comes out of this because some of the descriptors are saying, so for instance, the, um, uh, the myths here uh, describe conditions that uh, quite clearly could have been uh, Krakatoa or something very similar. Huge, giant um, uh, period where volcanic ash, which these people knew very well, was obscuring a great deal of the planet and causing problems with uh, uh, food sources and they had to choose different kinds of food and so on. And so we can make certain references that go back, but it, it seems that though they're describing the Sky People as having been a real problem uh, up until rather recently actually, until maybe as, as little a time ago as 15, 18,000 years ago, uh, before the last um, shift of the ages or whatever. And um, they were very dominant in that phase of uh, life and to the extent that many of the strategies and tactics employed by the coastal peoples up here developed during that period of time in reaction to the sky people. So we have tactics for instance in descriptions about you know from canoe builders guys about how to uh, paddle your canoes on into the estuaries and so on and uh, literally hug the banks and so on to, to avoid being seen as the sky people are overhead. We also have descriptions of the sky people's vessels, their canoes in the sky, and these kind of things and all of the myths. And then there's a basically a, uh, I don't want to say a, a cataclysm story, but there's a, a number of the, the myths that go to the idea that basically something changed at the solar level. And from that point on, the sky people departed and that the Sky People left over a relatively short period of time and were seen no more. Uh, this is long after n the Changer had left. But now, of course, curiously, in the, uh, to wrap up the story, and you know, like all good stories, there is the return, the prodigal son and all of that. Now, in this case, it's probably the, um, uh, the uh, formative matria uh, that's coming back. But there is a, there is a, discri a discussion within the, um, the myths that the uh, changer, the Nummo, will return. When we've made a certain level of progress and need to know certain things, Nummo's going to come on back and will be available to answer questions. <laughs> kind of, kind of a, a good service here, you know, a follow-up customer service kind of a deal. Uh, so, uh, you know, no time frame or anything, and it depended on our, our evolution and what uh, kind of crap happened to us. But um, very interesting. So, you know, it's very much like the, um, uh, and you see the same thing, you know, the, the coming back, the returning, all of this kind of stuff in all of the religious myths. But here we have it without any religion. We don't have the, any religious bent to any of these uh, stories throughout the Pacific Northwest, up from Alaska all the way down through. And by the way, there's a lot of these that are replicated. I've just started getting into them in Siberian stories from um, uh, the people have uh, been kicking around over there for a few uh, hundred years. Um, anyway, so uh, very, very interesting. The a really curious part about it to me, uh, I, it makes sense that it's you know pan global and all of this, and that if you got the Anunnaki mining gold in one part of the part of the planet, they would try to do the same kind of stuff uh, all over again. The uh, interesting parts of this are the really fine descriptions of the nasty sky people in a way we don't see anywhere else. In other uh, mythologies, the sky people are made into some form of gods. There's all this worship crap. And believe me, the, also the 
the uh, tinglet recorded that, that the, uh, the Anunnaki, the sky people, tried to make the tinglet uh, buy into lies. And the tinglet said, no, we, we don't understand reality this way, and we're not going to accept that. And anybody we run into, we're going to tell them, you know, you guys are full of it, that this is crap, you're not gods. Although you do muck about with DNA, and we've seen the results of it. So, very, very interesting subset and, and uh, of stories and a cross confirmation of the many of the stories that are in the um, uh, Dogon and also those that go ultimately to Zoroastrianism and then are um, um, chopped up and rehashed and re-sewn together and stitched up and made into Gilgamesh and then made into uh, the Bible. So, um, the, apparently, the Tinglet have a in the in the uh, Salish and the uh, natives in the Northern California all have a different take on it because they saw this whole thing as uh, without any uh, religious overtones. They just didn't buy into it. And their understanding of the whole nature of reality and their description of changer and such, they don't even apply those terms to changer. Changer was a being like us that had uh, you know, you could poke with your finger and it would slap you upside the head if you got it in a ticklish spot. Um, and you could interact with them and they liked salmon and, they, you know, they weren't very fond of blueberries. Uh, but they did like other things off the, the ground, but they were aquatic. And so you would go out and talk with them and if you were out paddling around your canoe, they may just pop their head up and say, hi, how are you? And by the way, here's a salmon for you. Uh, you know, and can we chat for a minute? And so, uh, as I say, a very interesting understanding of the creation myths and understanding of our species from the local Salish people. And then also a warning of the, you know, nasty sky bastards with the double rows of teeth that have these little, um, they weren't described as robots, but we would think of them as um, uh, mindless minions. And I think that's probably a real good description for the, the greys. It, because the, the locals up here had to deal with these things too. And they didn't like them much and apparently hated to have to chop them up because they were all oily and greasy and you could never really bury them without them contaminating the ground and the best thing you could probably do from their understanding was to put a bunch of rocks together and burn the bodies uh, rather than contaminate the soil. So uh, the cedar trees didn't like it. They have a relationship up here with the cedar trees and the cedar trees told them no you don't bury these uh, these bodies. You must dispose of them either. Um, on the uh, in some other manner and then the um, natives take the bodies and they try throwing them into the water and uh, salmon and uh, mink and uh, raven come down and and get the bodies and throw them back at the the natives and say no 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 this would pollute the water keep them out keep them out and then they um, take them and they sit them out and can't remember who it was that told them to burn the bodies but eventually that was the way in which they decided to dispose of these uh, little grays that they'd hacked to bits in this trap. Anyway, so uh, there you go. There's the uh, an encapsulation of the uh, creation myths uh, of our species from a viewpoint of the uh, local uh, Lushitisid people, uh, the Salish uh, salmon people, uh, also known as people of the water. And maybe that's what saved them from the fate that other humans f suffered in other parts of the planet is that we got a whole lot of damn water up here and for whatever reason the Anunnaki didn't like it. And that's our story. The book Habu is really worth reading if you have an interest in the changer stories. You won't find a great deal of detail. The stories are just that. Stories you'd tell around a uh, campfire uh, in an undocumented, un paperless, um, in a paperless uh, society. But they really do um, tell us uh, about the formation of reality in our species in a confirmatory way, but that also provides a very different view than we get out of those stories that originate in the Middle East about this very same subject, or Africa for that matter. And again, the amount of similarity between the Skagit, Salish, uh, Dinglet people's myths of the changer and the Sumerian descriptions of the, um, uh, or excuse me, the uh, Dogon descriptions of the Nummo. Uh, really, it's astounding. Um, there's none of, none of the ritual that the Dogon are really into 
because the reaction, the relationship of the locals with Changer was different. It was much more of um, far less, um, uh, I don't want to say it, uh, subservient. Uh, and it was just an entirely different relationship. And the character of that relationship is actually uh, brought across in the stories in a way that is entirely different than those you see uh, originating out of Gilgamesh or Sumerian myths or the Dogon's um, myths. So the reaction of those peoples to um, then the Nemo was entirely different than the locals up here in terms of how they were recorded. And I think maybe we've got a purer form of it up here. It's been less mucked about because there's been uh, less control system trying to do, system, do, do things with it. So I find the uh, descriptions here a little bit better, uh, a little bit more human. <laughs> anyway, so habu, habu to the storytellers. Onward. And that's the end of this one.